<laughs> yes. Okay, we've just taken off. We had a countdown, everyone, if you've, if you've just joined us. Um, look, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first technology uh, taster series uh, under the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan. My name is Dr. Alison Watson, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Um, and I'm joined by some super exciting speakers today. Just in case you missed this at the start, if you've got any technical issues, try logging off or on and on, send a message to Grow Asia in the chat box um, if, if you would like to do that. Um, the way uh, we actually interact today is by using the Q&A box. So if you have any questions, and we really encourage those questions to come through, please put those in the question and answer box. You can also use chat if you just wanna make a general comment. If you wanna say great, uh, great speech, um, you wanna share some work that you're doing with us, chuck it in the chat box but questions go in the Q&A box. If you could rename yourself, uh, that would be handy. Um, you can do that by just going under the participants, pressing more and you'll see a rename button. And please just put your name and organization if you can. Um, and if you really have a burning question and you want to ask that verbally or, or make a comment, please raise your hand and if we have time, we'll give you that opportunity. So just here, we have a very busy schedule with some exciting speakers. Um, before we start, we normally just warm up the room just to see uh, who is in the room with us. And so I'm going to ask Pranav, I think I, I chucked in a little poll there for everyone to answer. Could you launch that? There we go. So what we'd like you to do, there's, there's already over 134 people in the room, if, and we had 300 people register, um, so we should have a lot of people online today. If you could just select what best describes you. I'm going to wait a little bit longer so we can get most of you answering this poll. And I can see we've got a very strong representation actually from government, private sector and research organization and 1% farmer, which is, which is excellent. We'd like to see more of that. We're, we're gonna make an effort. I said that last time too, um, but great to see that, that one person there. Um, and we've got a small percentage of other in there as well. Um, but it looks pretty even actually. Okay, so there's the results. So great to have sort of a, a third, third, third of research, private and government. So that's the sort of triple, um, the, the triple uh, grouping that we quite like to see actually. Okay, so we're gonna st stop those, stop that poll. And I'll move on to the next slide. And that is a welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just move this. Can I move that? Yep, I can. So I'd now like to introduce Graham Dixie, the executive director from Grow Asia to give a brief welcome. Graham? Yes. Um well, you know, my, I have the, the joyous job of, of welcoming you. It's been a fantastic response. I can see 160 in the bottom of my screen. Um, over 300 people um, registered and a similar number for the previous uh, one of these webinars. And, and it, it, it seems that we've really got the creation of a community of practice, that there is a tremendous amount of interest and enthusiasm and something that we constantly find is that people want to learn and they want to learn from one another. And the, the takeaway from the last session, and I'm sure we'll have the same one from this session, is that we come away with a sense of surprise that just how advanced and sophisticated the researchers and the people working on this particular problem is in Asia and the keenness they are to learn from one another so we can build up better of using each other to climb up a ladder so that we can respond to this, this the, the problem of, of the fall army worm, which we estimated was over $800 million a year. So there's an awful lot hanging on your skills, your understanding and our ability to share information and respond quickly and effectively. Um, so uh, thank you very much for attending. And we, we look forward to the, the, the speaking, the, the presentations. Um, and particularly these ones are very important is that we're looking at precision of application and how we can use technology so that we can use, we be more effective, more cost effective and come up with solutions which are appropriate to the region. So I'll leave it to that, but I'm going to very much look forward to presentations from, from across the region. And I ought to, I ought to pay a particular thanks to Phil Abram from CBI Cabby 
who's woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning in England to join us. So a special thanks to you, Phil. Over. Great. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for that introduction. And also, I just make a big thank you to the ASEAN member states for your support to this regionally agreed program and to MAD Vietnam for your leadership as chair of the action plan. And it's good to see many of you on the call today. So just moving on, we're, we're up to our first speaker today, uh, Dr. Uh, Yuan from CAS. Um, he is a professor of Institute of the Plant Protection in the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. He's an expert of pesticide science. He's also a leader of projects on the National Natural Science Foundation of China. Um, he's also a founder of the Joint Laboratory for Unmanned Aerial Vehicles uh, with DGI, the world's largest manufacturer of drones. So he's uh, a perfect uh, presenter today on the potential for drones to um, control fall armyworms. So I think that Dr. Yang is going to present on behalf of uh, Dr. Yuan. <laughs> Dr. Yang? Okay. Just, I will move the slide. Show you that. Okay. Okay, so your first slide after your introduction was this one. Oh, can I? Okay, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, but this can I share the screen? Okay. Oh. No, I I will move the slides for you. So just tell oh, me when you want you, to move okay, the next yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah, next yeah. slide. Okay, yeah. great. Do you want to start okay. on this slide? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So are you going to um do you want to start presenting? Yes. Okay. Good. This is Okay. Okay. Can I start? Yes. Yes, you're welcome. Please do so. I do not share screen. Do you not see the screen? Yeah. No, 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 no. Can I share? Can I share? We, we can see the screen, but we can share the. Uh, yeah, can, can share the, the screen? Do, do you want to put your own presentation up? Yeah. Th this is your presentation, so you can just talk to it and tell me when to press next slide. Yeah. Take the, she changed the slide. Oh, you changed the slide. For me. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. First, 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 first slide. Okay, okay. Okay. First, first okay. Line. okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, first I will introduce the information of your screen in, in China. Uh, in the past five, five years, there were uh, 73 increase, increase in the number, aircraft, uh, number of drone aircraft in, used in Chinese, uh, Chinese agriculture. And also there were uh, about uh, 90, 93 increase in the uh, applied area of drone screen in China. So, okay, the next, next, okay. The needs of drone screen for FAW management in China are first, the drone screen is welcome in mountain area because uh, because the drone screen uh, lead uh, a very small amount of screen, screen solution. And the second, drone screen can be employed by smallholder farmers and groups of farmers. Third, drone screen is labor saving and low cost. The, the estimated cost of drone screen is about $20 per hectare. Okay, next. But the drone screen also has shortcomings. First, FAW Navy migrate to the world of emergency and they stay inside the world of coincidence to clear the growing, growing point. But the spread jobly 
um, cannot go inside the wall. So spray droplets are hard to reach out the FAW larvae. Okay, next. Second, the high risk, high risk of droplet drift. We found the droplet spread by drone can be mined 28 meters away from the applica application site at uh, the wind speed of 0 0.8. Next. Okay, here are two examples for the droplet drift. The art picture is the first waving stand caused by the droplet drift, and the lower picture is the bad crawfish. It happened 200 meters away from the application site. Next. So, uh, we, so, to solve the problem of your screen, we developed the alternative your application of tiny granules. The strengths of tiny granules um, are first. The tiny, tiny granule can eliminate the drift of insect size. Uh, in the in in the wind, a uh, shift. You can you can you can take a look at the picture. In the in the wind, a shift may occur to tiny granules, but no drift. And in the down downward wind of drones, the 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 wind can facilitate facilitate the separation of tiny granules. Okay, next. Okay, you can you can you can take a look at the picture on the left. The top and body leaf and the wall form a lateral a lateral structure to collect the granules for the core, for the core, core plants. And in the downwind of a, of a drone, the granule can be blown into the wall. Even at the bottom, for the bottom of wall, you can take a look, you can take a, take, take a look at the picture on the right. Next. Okay. Oh, oh. oh sorry. Okay. The, the third strength of the tiny, tiny granules is the reduced risk of killing natural enemies by insecticide. Because uh, it's a new technology, so this is the hypothesis need to make confirm. Okay. Here's the characteristics of newly developed tiny granules. The, the tiny granules are sought out by CB, and the size of granules are 30 to 40 mesh. And the granule number is to more than 8,000 granules per gram, per gram. So it is feasible to mimic the spring jump, the drop leaves. So, our, our, so the, the aim of our technology uh, is to mimic the, the spring drop leaves. I think it's a breakthrough in FAW management. Okay, next. Uh, for good coverage, for good coverage um, uh, of containing grant and um, 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 leave the granule size and granule number are uh, two very important parameters. You can say the the first the 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 the, the, the first two low two, two low that's the commercial gran granules. The car for the coverage, there there will be there will be less one less than one granule per square centimeter, and the 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 low the, the lower to low, that the self made the, the self the self made granule, especially on the the next 
the the net the cotton that net the net row the net row the thirty the thirty to forty match granule. There were there, there will be more than ten granules per square centimeter. So next, okay, for good for good coverage of tiny granules and leaves, not one millimeter granules are leaded. And then next, but it's a challenge to manufacture the less than one millimeter granule, but now, but now we can make it. Next. Here, I'll introduce the many, many flight parameters. The, the flight height in the range of 1.5 to 3.5 meters. The, a lower flight height can increase the separation of tiny granules in the world. Next, okay. The flight velocity uh, on the left, the velocity is four meters per second. On the right, the velocity is six meters per second. You can say, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, at, at, the velocity, at the velocity of four meters per second, more granules deposit in the in, in the war of French. Okay, next. Okay. Here's the distribution of granules in in the in the canopy of of cone plants. The highlight the highlight columns are hatchet of FAW larvae. You can you see effective deposition of tiny granules in FAW habitat. It's the chemical effect of tiny granules, tiny granules granule through drone application. Okay, uh, for granule application, the chemical effect is more than 80 percent, but the, but for drone spray, the control control spray the control effect only seven seven. So. The, the, the granny application is better than drug free. Okay, next. Uh, besides FAW management, management the, ta the tiny granny technology can be used in corn butter, sugar cane butter, and soil pesticide, pest insect man management. Okay, thank you. So. Okay, thank you. I'll just turn on my. I'll just turn on my. Um, oh, you can hear me. <laughs> Here we go. I thought I'd muted myself. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for that very interesting presentation. Um, we already have many questions for you, so we're going to have about sort of six to ten minutes of questions now. And I have a first question here around. Um, the economics uh, of this approach. What what is the um, is is the drone? Is it is it costly? I mean, do farmers have to uh, invest in an upfront cost of buying the drone, or do they do they rent it, or how do you see that working at the moment? Is it is is it purely a research uh, project? And so, how do you see that uh, being rolled out uh, for farmer use? Uh, you mean the, 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 the cost just, just for the, just for drone screen, not, yep. not, 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 uh, not the cost, not the cost of the pesticide. Okay, great. And, and what, here's a question from Romy Burano. What type of drones do you use and where can you buy them? <laughs> uh, uh, I think at at I know each each manufacturer of 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 drone they install the the granny applicate and the yes you can buy you can buy it. 
yes. yes. I've got a question here um, from Prasanta Patra. Uh, we hear that fall armyworm attack in China has been low to moderate and has decreased in 2020 compared to 2019. What is your assessment on the severity and spread of fall armyworm in China? What, has, what, what is your assessment on the severity and spread of fall armyworm this year in China? Is it, is it getting, is it worse than last year or is it better than last year? The fall armyworm attack. Some person key Sometimes it'll be a Yeah. What, what, what's, what, what's, I'm sorry, what's, uh, which, which species? In China, is fall yeah. armyworm worse this year or is it better than last year the infestation of fall armyworm do you see it more severe uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah i i i think the, uh the current i i think the current may be the same yes <laughs> okay yeah. Yes, yeah, this year. Yeah, this, this year. Yes, I have another question. Have you conducted similar trials on sugar cane stem borers yet? <laughs> just, 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 uh, just a hypothesis, I think. <laughs> just a hypothesis at the moment. I think so the, 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 the sugar cane borer maybe have the have seen have. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, the state, what was the uh, in the world of sugar cane after, after emergency and, and kill the point, the, the green point of sugar cane. So I think it's very similar to uh, uh, for army, army arm. It's very similar. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Is there, is there any different in the effectiveness when this technique is used for different ages of corn? Uh, I think it has, um, and just the, you can use, you can use this technology and take technology at the all stage, all stage. All stage. Yeah, just because I, I have mentioned in, in, in my present, in my presentation that the, the lateral, the, the natural structure to collect the granules. Not, 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 not like not, 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 not like a funnel, you understand? Yes. That's, that's, that's very that's very that's very very important. The the the, the natural the, the natural structure to collect the the the, 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 the granules. Yes, in the world. So excellent. Yeah, that's a good so, point. Yeah, yeah. So so you you can you, you can apply this technology at the world stage. Excellent. No, that is a very good point. And I've got a question here. You had a slide that showed dead crawfish or crayfish 200 meters from the application site. <laughs> was, this, was this because of the insecticide had been used wrongly in the first place? Or is this something that you normally see? Huh? <laughs> Oh, was it? Okay. Um, yeah. Right. And your, your next steps, I think I, I had seen uh, when you announced this uh, sort of you break through with the, the very small granules. I think you're looking at uh, commercializing this. What, what are your next steps there? Uh, I, see, I think that up to now, the commercial, commercial granules uh, is not suitable to the technology because I think that for good coverage, for good coverage, co coverage that the less than one milliliter granules uh, I leave it. It's, uh, they are not commercial. Sorry. So I'm trying to to make them commercial now. Excellent. So that's what you're working on your next steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
I have a question here around the, here's a very specific question around the manufacturing process of the granules. Uh, you did say this was a challenge at this small size. Somebody saying, <laughs> somebody is asking, will it block the nozzles? I guess we're, we're it's so small. Um, what is required to get the product size to less than one millimeter? Uh, I think I think I think it's hard to it's very hard to answer answer the your this this question because I cannot estimate the the, the price of the penny penny granules. Maybe I think uh should be same should be should be similar to regular regular formulations of patch set. Should should I guess. Okay. <laughs> another another quick question because we're going to move on to our next speaker soon. But um, how many times do you need to apply per crop cycle on your experimental crops, for example? You have a, a cost of twenty USD per hectare, I think. That was per application, and do you need only one application? Or do you need multiple applications? Oh, I the, uh, maybe I cannot answer and also I cannot answer this, this question because just uh, I just developed this technology. I will uh, uh, I'll conduct more research to answer the, answer this. I think <laughs> next time. Yeah, yes, maybe, yes, maybe, I think. So in, I your, think in your experiment so far, in your field testing, you've done how many, just one application or two to three applications? Maybe, I think, that depends on depends on the the current the, the current of the uh, FAW. I think in the in, in maybe in in southern in in in, in southern China, maybe two or three times. But in central China, maybe just one time. Okay, excellent. Uh, now I, we have um, two people who have raised their hands. I'm probably just going to choose one. Um, Pranav, uh, are you able to see those people? And yeah, it's just. Uh, oh, I think it must have been an accident. They lowered their hands. Oh, excellent. <laughs> well, not excellent. It's great to have you raise your hand. So don't don't let me um, give you the impression that we don't want you to do that. Um, so thank you very much. We're just going to move on to our next speaker. If you could just stay online, um, that would be great. The team there in China, and you can actually see the questions that have been asked if you go into your question and answer box. If you have okay, the time, okay. if you have the time to write any answers, um, that would be gratefully uh, appreciated. And I'm sure there's, okay, 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 there's some very specific questions there, so um, people are extremely interested. So that would be most helpful. And I'm then going to move on to our next speaker or speakers. Uh, our second speakers today are from a Singapore startup, Chloropy, and we have the co-founder and CEO, Gajendra Babu, who worked for 16 years in the agrochemical industry, uh, and Apoor Vash, who is the co-founder and chief technical officer, who has a master's degree of background in robotics. So I'd like to welcome you um, to, the, to the webinar. If you could um, just make sure that you are unmuted. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Alison. And thanks to Grow Asia to give uh, an opportunity for us to present our technology here. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone who have joined. Uh, nice to see a lot of industry colleagues there as well. Um, and from academia. Uh, yeah, so we are Chloropy. Uh, Chloropy Technologies, uh, founded by Apur and myself last year. We are a registered company in Singapore and operate in India and uh, Asia. So uh, Chloropy is a young deep tech company providing software platform to collect and manage data from farms. Using our platform, agronomists can collect uh, plant level data using drones and the cutting edge AI technology. Today I will share uh, some of the advanced technologies such as uh, computer vision and drones that we are using to assess uh, fall on your damage in farms. Uh, Next slide, please. 
So, you know, drones are a powerful tools that can collect huge amounts of uh, data in a short time. And it can cover uh, like a 10 to, you know, in 10 to 15 minutes, it can cover an acre. Um, so we then use the proprietary AI algorithms to interpret these images uh, to get to very specific insights. Apart from uh, saving time and cost, the data collected is precise and uh, consistent across locations and also over seasons, which is very critical for any R&D activity. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so what exactly we do is we interpret the drone imagery into precise insights using appropriate computer vision and deep learning algorithms. So when I say precise insights, uh, these can be you know, classified as quantitative parameters or qualitative. Uh, in quantitative, it's about detecting the shape, size of plants, um, even like a plant height or yield estimation. And uh, coming to the qualitative parameters, we can detect uh, color, pest and disease symptoms, uh, and the quality parameters, other quality parameters like texture even. And uh, we are developing solutions for corn, rice, and a few vegetables. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have built this uh, platform called Chloropy Info Management System, or SIMS. Uh, and uh, so this is an interactive platform for our you know, clients to visualize, run analytics, or store the field maps and data onto the platform. And the SIMS runs on the cloud service and not on your computer, which means that uh, multiple uh, you know, users in your organization or in your team can view the same data from multiple devices in real time. And uh, so pictures have to be uploaded to the platform uh, to get your analytics. And uh, it's the cool part is that anyone around the world who has a drone uh, can use this platform to perform the analytics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so getting uh, into the subject today on the follow me worm. Uh, so it has been established that follow me worm, uh, if it appears early in the crop season, it can totally damage the crop causing more than 90% yield loss. So it's very important that uh, the early stage of the crop is monitored for pest incidents and damage uh, for timely decision making uh, and so that we can protect the crop and protect the yield. Um, so we know that CIMIT and other organizations recommend that the fields, uh, corn fields have to be scouted every seven days. Uh, but it's very laborious to really, um, you know, go around the field and scout, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to scout the field for, and assess the damage going row by row or, or do the, the survey. And that is where these drones are really helpful uh, to do this uh, you know, scouting and assessing the damage. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to show a few examples of how we collect the data to assess the follow me bomb damage. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, the first example is about the early vegetative stage. Uh, it's around 15, 20 days crop. And uh, here we rapidly count the plant stand and the spot areas where plants are missing. So we fly drones uh, over the corn crop and take uh, hundreds of pictures uh, for, uh, you know, for each acre. And we upload these pictures to our SIMS platform where it uh, you know, processes uh, the pictures for quality and so on. Uh, we run our uh, artificial intelligence algorithms to count uh, the number of plants precisely going like pixel by pixel on the images. These algorithms are built using uh, artificial neural networks, which is a very technical uh, field. Uh, uh, and it uh, usually takes less than a minute to, you know, uh, to do this analysis. So it's just a you know, click of the button, you run the analytics and get the results out. And it's irrespective of the size of the field. So uh, you know, it's, it's quite fast. And uh, uh, next slide, please. So you can here see, uh, uh, you know, the small red dots that uh, are on the on the image. So those are the plants that are identified by the uh, algorithms that we have. Yeah, next slide, please. And you can see a close up of how these plants are identified in each row and, and, and in the plot. So we can identify 
uh, the plant population of the entire plot or entire field and also we can identify the missing plants in each plot or each row. So it's, uh, the tool is very interactive and uh, the users, the agronomists can really choose which area they want to you know, count or which area they want to assess the damage. And, uh, and this data can be uploaded uh, from this platform as a, as a you know, CSV file to an Excel sheet. And uh, using this technology, uh, we are assessing the efficacy of different control methods. And right now we are using this uh, to assess the seed treatment uh, efficacy um, in large field trials. And we are now doing for uh, you know, few companies. Uh, uh, you know, we are offering this uh, for few companies now. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. And in a very similar way, uh, we also use this uh, same technology to assess the damage of the fallen bivalve in the vegetative stage. So this is around 35 days old crop. And uh, here, um, here our algorithms detect the symptoms from the images and classify them you know, into four classes, uh, like healthy, uh, low damage, medium damage, or severe damage based on the on the following bivalve symptoms so uh, as i mentioned the uh, you know the algorithm really runs pixel by pixel to identify the damage and then it, it uh, you know you, it classifies these uh, plants into these uh, four four different buckets yeah and uh, similarly the data can be exported uh, to the you know to the excel sheet and uh, yeah please uh, next slide please and we can use these technologies uh, to assess the follow me from damage in research trials to precisely quantify efficacy of uh, the control methods. Uh, it could be the seed treatment uh, methods, or it could be you know, the, the foliar sprays, or even it could be used for estimating the efficacy of biological control. Uh, or this can be also used in seed production and commercial forms to monitor and take control measures and uh, to know whether the damage has crossed the uh, economic threshold level so that uh, the pesticide sprays can be you know, uh, done. And uh, so though uh, drones are very powerful tools to collect images and do all these analytics, uh, but they ha also have some limitations uh, uh, such as like, uh, we can't use these uh, you know, tools or the drones to scan large acreages in a short time because uh, it's not so scalable. Uh, so satellite imagery can be a useful tool uh, to, to fill this gap. Uh, unfortunately, satellite imagery also has limitations in terms of uh, image resolution. Uh, they can't pick up uh, all the details of the fall on bomb damage um, you know, because uh, it's not really possible. Uh, and also the cost is, is another major factor. Um, so fusing drone imagery and satellite imagery could be an ideal solution uh, to monitor the geographical, geographical spread of fallen bomb and give early warning system to uh, farmers at a regional level. So we are not yet there, but uh, we are looking for partners to work with uh, so that uh, we have, you know, uh, we can uh, deliver this kind of solution jointly. Yeah, I think that's all I have. Uh, thanks uh, for your listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Gajendra. And um, I'm not sure if Apoorva is going to uh, join us, but I've got lots of questions coming in. So thank you so much for that presentation and, and giving us some insight into um, your solution for Fall Army Worm. Um, I've got a question here. Um, is there any specific type of drone that has to be used to capture images? Um, yeah, Apoor has uh, joined us with us here, and uh, maybe he can answer that as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I'm audible. Um, but currently, we are uh, we from the very beginning we tried to make the technology as scalable as possible. So we try to use the most the ch like cheapest commercial available drone, which has the minimal requirements of the camera, but can still uh, deliver the quality of data that we need. Uh, obviously, uh, the drone is just a way of capturing device and there's some SOP that needs to be followed, how high it needs to fly and so forth. Uh, but the requirements in terms of the hardware are very minimal, actually. Basically, any commercial drone uh, we can 
be made the text so that any commercial drone can be uh, used Excellent. to assess the damage. Great. Uh, I have a question here from Olivia Reynolds. Um, can you differentiate fall armyworm damage from other Lepidopteran pests that feed in similar ways? And can growers obtain, obtain real-time information, for example, the percentage of their crop that's damaged by fall armyworm? Um, yeah, so uh, on the first question, uh, we can differentiate uh, the fall armyworm damage provided we see the symptoms very clearly. Uh, but then uh, some of the damages are quite close, you know, the lepidopterans uh, for example, other Spodoptera can cause very similar damage. So it's not technically possible to, uh, uh, to just by seeing the image, uh, you know, to differentiate the, uh, uh, the damage at the species level. But then uh, knowing the, uh, the occurrence and uh, doing, you know, having some preliminary information on the spread of fall armyworm in that geography, then it's possible to uh, to know what is the extent of the damage, but otherwise it's going to give uh, more uh, a comprehensive, uh, you know, damage number. Okay. Uh, on the second question, uh, so whether it can be done real time? Yeah, that's a great question actually. Uh, so the, the technology is available. It's all about capturing the images and uploading to the platform. So. As I mentioned, the analytics itself doesn't take uh, you know, more than a couple of minutes to run. So it's all about uh, capturing that image and, and uploading to the platform, which would anywhere take, uh, you know, if everything is in place, it would, should not take more than uh, an hour or so. Okay. So you mean for the data analytics, the time it takes for that would be an hour or so from when you collect it. And, and how long does it take to do, you know, per hectare basis? I mean, how long does it take for the drone to, to collect all the information and then have it loaded up? Um, so uh, just to fly and collect the data, it, it may take like 15, 20 minutes, uh, uh, you know, from an egg, uh, from a hectare of, uh, of cornfield. Uh, to uh, upload them, it depends on uh, things like uh, your internet connectivity and so on, but uh, it should not take more than an hour to upload it to our platform. Yeah. And, and so what is the efficiency of each drone, like in hectares, covered per day? And how much is the cost, is an answer, that, a question that we have from John. Mm -hmm. um, so efficiency, uh, as I mentioned, the drones uh, have limitations and uh, most of the drones that are available in the market can fly uh, for a maximum of uh, 30 minutes with one battery. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which means that if you want to fly more area, uh, more acreage, then you need to have multiple uh, sets of uh, the battery with you. And uh, so that's all available in the market. It's all up to you, you know, how much you want to do and, uh, uh, and so on, uh, and how much you, you can afford. Uh, regarding the cost, um, the cost of the drones can be as low as uh, like $500. Uh, so it's quite affordable and it, it kind of costs less than a you know, mobile phone these days. So you can really uh, uh, buy these drones off the market and uh, you know, at, at, at a very affordable price. Okay, here's a question here, and um, it, it is quite specific. It's, is using an NDVI camera the same as using the AI to assess the corn plant damage, or is it better using the AI algorithm? Um, yeah, uh, NDVI is, is a good tool, but uh, the, our customers need a precise plant level data, and NDVI resolution is not that great to identify the, uh, the damage on each plant. So we don't use NDVI for this uh, damage assessment purpose, uh, but it can, it can be used for some other, you know, uh, for some other purposes. So like uh, getting uh, the, the health of the crop, or uh, overall crop, you know, like uh, uh, if you want to assess the damage or uh, health of the crop, uh, or uh, like five or 10 hectares, probably it can give some indication. The other drawback with NDVI, just using NDVI is that you never know 
what is uh, the reason for the for the for the for the crop health, right? Um, if uh, suppose the uh, there could be variety of factors which uh, can cause uh, uh, a crop deteriorate. For example, it could be drought, or it could be flooding, or it could be a nutrition, uh, and so on. So, uh, NDVA doesn't exactly say what is the cause of the uh, of the damage or of the. Okay. So your problem. your technology actually gives a, a huge amount of detail around what is actually causing. Uh, damage yeah. to the crop right. and is it still effective in hilly areas you can use it in all areas uh, yeah uh, yeah it can be used in all terrains actually it's more useful for slopey terrains and where uh, you Excellent. know manually it's not possible to access and you're, you're testing this at the moment or you're, you're doing trials field trials which countries are you currently working in so we are working in India and we have a pilot project in Indonesia as well. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, this is open to, you know, like anyone who has a drone and who can fly a drone in their, uh, in their geography. So uh, actually it's, uh, it's not restricted uh, from a service delivery point of view. Great. I've got one question here and then I think we need to move on. Um, uh, this question is, um, how do you commercialize this technology? Do you provide the service and charge per hectare basis to the farmers or do you have another model in mind? Yeah, that's exactly. So we, we charge as per the uh, area cover yeah, because it's all about uh, how much uh, data we process and uh, what kind of uh, uh, you know, analytics we provide. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now, I'm just going to ask you, the, uh, you to do the same thing, actually, um, both of you. If you can hop on to the question and answer section, you can see all the questions that have come in um, about uh, your presentation. And if you could have a go at answering some of those, I'm, I'm, that would be greatly um, appreciated. And thank you, both of you, for um, joining us today. Thank, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you both, and good luck. Thank um, you. Bye -bye. Right, we're going to move on to our next speaker today. And that is Phil Abrahams from, from Prize and Carby. Um, Phil is actually joining us from like sort of three o'clock, 3.30 in the morning uh, in the, from the UK. So he's done a fantastic job and he looks, he looks very fresh and, and, and ready to go actually. So welcome, Phil. Thank you, Alison. Looks can be deceiving. Um, good morning, all. Thank you for the invitation to Grow Asia. This is an excellent webinar. I'm really enjoying the presentations so far. So this is to give a background to a program, a five-year program funded by the UK Space Agency called PRIZE, the Pest Risk Information Service. So on we go, Alison, please. Just as a background, and you may have seen that there was a link in the um, invitation to the webinar, which you're welcome to view an 80 second overview of what PRIZE is doing. Um, our output is to determine how we can provide relatively geospecific um, time to action alerts to farmers and intermediaries and to stakeholders in the agricultural sector on the economic thresholds to uh, intervene on particular pests, including fall armyworm, on the assumption that um, resource poor farmers may only have a very limited number of uh, shots of being able to intervene with pesticides to kill a particular pest. So when are they best able to make that intervention and kill the maximum number of insects? We're combining um, a whole range of earth observation data from uh, land surface temperature, leaf, wet, leaf wetness and vegetation index, um, running a combination of phenological and statistical models that look at the biology of the pest in relation to um, the above issues such as temperature, with temperature being the most important factor and combining that with calibration and validation with real-time field observations which we use for ground truthing and we're using combinations of such things as ground-based data loggers and extension staff from another program 
that we use, such as PlantWise, which trains our plant doctors who are able to give us observations. PRIZE is an experimental program and it's currently running in Kenya, Ghana, Zambia and Malawi. To the next slide, Alison. Thank you. So we're not just looking at fall armyworm. Um, we're um, doing within this pilot uh, testing models for a variety of insect pests within the maize cropping system, so maize, beans and tomato primarily. We're beginning in this year and next to take a look at how we can model some of the main economically damaging plant pathog pathogens on maize, bean and tomato and um, we'll be widening this out as the program matures into other crops and other pests. And next slide. All of this, um, the data that we, we talk about, the, um, the maps, um, standard static store sources like county maps, administrative maps, these are layered with, um, with other information from our partner Assimila. And then they are taking dynamic source information, both live and legacy data, on weather combined with the observations from satellites which depending on the data set are either updated um, every 15 minutes, um, every few hours, um, once a week and so forth through to um, just requiring uh, a one-time shot and then we're also blending that with the observations from the PlantWise program which is basically uh, a global program of, if you like, pop-up plant health clinics with trained plant doctors giving feedback on pest observations um, that they observe in a network of plant clinics spread across Africa, Asia and Central, Central America. These are all blended into a data cube um, which generates the risk models that help us provide pest and disease forecasts, which we then spread out. Our aim is to try and provide farmers with advance notice, typically seven to 10 days advance notice of when to take action to reach that peak optimum intervention. On to the next slide. So the pest models are looking at the likelihood of um, a pest burden exceeding the economic threshold at a particular location. By the economic threshold, I mean, is the cost of the damage of fall armyworm likely to exceed the, um, the cost of treating the fall armyworm? Um, if it's not, then the farmer is spending his or her money too soon, or indeed may not even require to spend their money because the, the treatment will be more costly than the damage that they could bear. But vice versa, it's important that they do it um, in reverse. And if the damage is going to be more, then the, uh, the medicine, if you like, is a good investment. We're looking to see whether we can provide um, in the models sufficient accuracy that we're confident that we are providing predictable population growth relative to temperature and are those growth patterns um, common across agroecological zones for that pest irrespective of the numbers of pests at a location and the locality and the evidence so far as we move into year four of the program is yes the accumulation um, population burden follows the same curve which is validating the models we're running. The models are a combination of spatial and temporal pest risk mapping therefore. The satellite pixel sizes are 10 square kilometers with the ground-based loggers and uh, weather mass that we've been using that's been brought down to four square kilometer grids and during the course of this year and early next we anticipate being able to reduce that resolution to one square kilometer. The models factor in the overlapping instar stages of the pests that we're looking at to determine um, at what stage of a particular pest um, the damage has been created. 
and we're looking for insect pests in particular the degree days so insects as you'll know appreciate breed within minimum and maxima temperatures we can convert those to calendar days since the planting date uh, because of the average constancy of temperatures over the last 20 30 years uh, despite the uh, issues of climate change, there is still relative constancy in the short term, which allows us to understand how many generations of a pest are appearing. That runs, helps us run a development rate model to predict in the number of de degree days the phenological events uh, in the crop, uh, in the pest bio biology from the date of the crop start to allow us to give that peak kill time to action. And then we're comparing additionally that information against legacy information from the last 18 years average for particular areas. So we can tell farmers and extension staff compared with the average for the last 20 odd years is the breeding rate of this particular pest running slower or faster than the average and that will help us also indicate whether action events uh, need to be brought forward or feasibly would be pushed back at points in the growing season. Next slide please Alison. We're disseminating this through two methods primarily. We're using mobile partners in Africa, Precision Agriculture for Development, ISOCO and shortly ICAO to push out SMS alerts to their farmers. But we're also providing twice monthly PDF bulletins um, per crop to our plant wise plant doctors. These contain a mapped pest forecast for the plant doctor. Um, linked with PlantWise Pest Management Decision Guide recommendations, which are available to them, indeed to all of you, open access on the PlantWise website, uh, and MET Department rainfall forecasts. And that then means that the plant doctors or other extension officers who know their farmer clients can provide them with customized information. Um, with PAD, we ran last season um, a survey in Kenya on the uh, understanding of the fall armyworm results. Those results have just recently come in. Farmers reported about 87% fully understood the fall armyworm alerts that they were receiving uh, via SMS. 60% of them um, actively changed their farming practices, reporting a positive outcome. 43% of farmers changed the spraying date of their crop based on the alerts, but interestingly, no farmers sprayed more as a consequence of the alerts. There was no um, significant statistical difference in the spraying totals. But uh, also encouragingly, farmers' behavior and knowledge improved through the service that they were getting. They were more aware and more likely to seek further information, more likely to scout their farm for evidence of damage and then take action. On to the next slide. Here is an example of the bulletin that we um, send to our plant doctors. So this was dated in April of this year. It provides heat maps of the midpoint, the number of days to wait from the planting date until the farmer should take control actions and a plus or minus midpoint value that gives farmers via the extension agent a range of time in which to take the control action. Um, and the extension officer is provided with additional information that they can decide to pass on about what symptom of the instar to look out for on the crop and what intervention is recommended um, using IPM based recommendations to uh, intervene. On we go. We, of course, like any program, suffer challenges and need to uh, confront these. As ever, with a technology-led program, data is the big issue. And if this program is to extend to Asia, we would expect that to be seen as well. 
the Asian context of fall armyworm geopresence and whether it's now a resident or indigenous pest um, is important to understand across the ASEAN countries. Um, if it's still an invasive pest, there may need to be some inclusion of dispersal modelling in what we do. I'm just going to interrupt, Phil. You've just got um, probably 30 seconds if you could Ooh, just right. summarise okay. your... Thanks. So user overload, we can provide too much information. Um, so we need to cluster in alerts. We need to do data corrections and there are unexpected events. One of our weather masts was attacked by an amorous giraffe, for example. Next slide. Hello, Nick. thank you. Yep. In terms of value for money, um, the cost effectiveness was compared against manual field data collection and drone data collection. The prize approach was three pence per one pound uplift in project costs in, in terms of yield benefits, as opposed to manual field data with weather stations of 22 pence and drones of seven pence. And the next slide, finally. Have you got it? Thank you. Um, if we were to extend prize to Asia, well, we believe it's transferable as a concept. The Asian fall armyworm is the same specie, species as Africa, so the models would apply. We're already running Earth observation projects um, in oh, Colombia sorry. and um, in terms of bioefficacy in China. Uh, other models also, by the way, are on the way on potato. It will need to work with a mixed farmer extension model. We can either use the plant-wise network or maybe there are um, business to consumer mobile or platform, platform services that we can collaborate with. It would need data and literature sourcing um, and of course a clear Asian user driven proposition. Um, the issue is who pays um, the services free to farmers so there would need to be some level of support either from the donor community or business players who see um, benefit in understanding the risk to their growers and their sector um, by doing by using and leveraging the data analytics from prize so sorry for a rush at the end there um, but that's, happy to take questions. That's great, Phil, and thank you very much for that. It's a very detailed presentation. There's lots of information in there. Uh, a couple of questions. I mean, you, you talk about here potential for a pilot um, in a country in Southeast Asia. How, how long would it take to get sort of a pilot up and running? I mean, what kind of information do you need, for example, to plug into your, to your models? For full armyworm, as I say, the model is available to run. We could um, pretty much run the model from now and do some testing across the literature as well, but um, that wouldn't be an issue. I think what we would need to do is to seek replicated data on field population dynamics across some agroecological zones. Um, that would allow us to calibrate the local conditions and allow us also to understand what the status is of fall armyworm invasion in one of the ASEAN countries that Grow Asia is, is linked with. Um, but, you know, I think that feasibly could do be done within a matter of months. Um, I wonder whether my science colleagues listening on the call would be sort of tearing their hair out at that claim, but I, th I think that's that's feasible um, given that data. Okay. Now, there's also a lot of information that's collected that isn't visible in this data cube that you were talking about um, because you are, you're giving sort of a limited sort of information to the farmer through a extension agent, but you're also collecting all this information with all this mapping and, and overlaying of different models and, and maps. Who might be able to access that information? Is that sort of locked away somewhere and no one can see it? Or is there a feasibility in the future that other stakeholders can access that, like regulators or other digital IPM providers? So for our in-country partners, we're making the data available um, open access. What uh, we tend to find, though, is that what they appreciate is if we do the data analytics mm -hmm. so they don't have to. 
Um, for the private sector, we would um, most likely charge an access fee. Uh, we're working through the business metrics of that now. So either we could charge to hand over the raw data for a commercial company to analyze themselves, or we can do an analytics service under terms of agreement with them. Um, for the academic sector, we're looking at doing a sort of um, shared data model so that we can open up the data under license to particular academic users in exchange for being able to blend their own data with ours so that we can uh, grow and learn together by um, combining data sets. Great. Okay, Phil, so we, we have to move on to our next speaker, but I'd like to say thank you very much um, for joining us at this, this very early time. It's an extremely interesting um, potential project here um, for Southeast Asia. And I, I, I really like the this economic threshold idea, bringing that in and clearly giving information to, to to farmers uh, and using the extension agents as a point for farmer contact as well. So thank you very much, Phil. If you can see the questions and answers, you may be able to answer some that are coming through. Um, feel free to have a browse in there and, and see what you can respond to. But I'm going to move on to the next speaker who's also gonna be talking about digital IPM and, and farmer communication. So I'll just flick through here to introduce uh, Leron Brish, CEO of US digital IPM tool FarmDog. Now Leron is going to share with us today how FarmDog connects with farmers and builds off their strengths as expert advisors in the field. And so while there's going to be some differences, of course, from farming systems in the US versus Southeast Asia, many differences, there's also some things in common also. And I think um, farmers are in the field every day. They care about their crops. It's their livelihood. And Leron is going to show us how to tap into that source of valuable information and expertise. Leron, um, are you, are you, can you join us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alison. And thank you, Grow Asia, for having me. And uh, it was a pleasure to hear about all the other initiatives going on there. So as Allison mentioned, I'm Leron Bish. I'm the founder and CEO of FarmDog. Uh, Going to give slightly different perspective. Um, we are based out of, out of California. Most of our work today is in North America with some pockets in Latin America, <coughs> excuse me, Europe, and some in Asia as well. Uh, next, please. So... I'm not going to focus on the right side. We all know that we need to get better um, in, in our pesticide use and its efficacy and how it affects the environment. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the left side, which is the analog aspect of how we deal with pest and disease issues today. This is a photograph of me out in, out in the field just a couple of years ago out here in the States. Um, and really the, the issue that we see is that to get to better pest and disease management decisions, whether it's fall armyworm, whether it's a disease, whether it's some other, some other pest, we really need to be able to, to leverage this data that folks are creating out in the field. Um, Phil's mentioned ground truthing, a few other folks mentioned ground truthing, um, is really how do we leverage that ground truth data into better decision making. Next, please. And so that's what FarmDog, the FarmDog platform is. It's a mobile and web-based platform that really starts from a field management aspect, which is moving that person from pen and paper to a digital app, and then utilizing that information that they're using into verification, compliance, sustainability benchmarking, efficacy benchmarking, and then all the way to supply chain integration. Um, I'm just going to Mentioned this very, very briefly, um, Dr. Yuan and his team uh, spraying from drones. We've done that. We're not a drone spraying company, but we've leveraged the data that our users have inputted, integrated with a drone spraying company to really complete um, that supply chain integration. But it starts from that data entry from the user. Next, please. And so this is what it looks like. We move from pen and paper to our app. Um, it's just an easy digital data entry um, platform that starts that analog to digital transformation. When I go speak to a user and our users are agronomists, researchers, and government folks, I don't talk about, hey, we're going to save you on pesticides or, hey, we're going to increase the yield. What I say is what FarmDog can do is we're going to save you time out in, your field, out in the field and improve your communication. Why? 
because you, the user, or the advanced sophisticated, using Graham's words from earlier, the advanced sophisticated users um, that frankly today are wasting too much time on the administrative aspect of collecting information, sharing that information, and unfortunately, and unfortunately losing that available time to the stuff that you're really good at, which is analyzing the information and taking that information and getting to insights and getting to actual insights to figure out what to do out in the field. Next, please. By virtue of what, we do, of, of what we've built, and I'll get into more of the details in a bit, um, that day one value proposition with time savings and improved communication, that leads to adoption, right? And so on the left, you see some of the, some of the um, accolades that we've received out here in the, in the US, uh, top 20 app you should know for 2020 and beyond, top nine app you shouldn't farm without. Um, we were being used on about 28 US states back in July, six Canadian provinces, one state, Mexico and our users collected over 70,000 field observations. What do I mean by field observation? That is a pest type, severity level to that pest, and all geo-reference to a field. So fall armyworm, severity level high. Fall armyworm, severity level eight per 20 plants. Fall armyworm, severity level you know, 20%. Whatever severity level that our users utilize, we're able to support that. We collect those observations. Um, and really help them focus on, on the so what. Next slide, please. And the way we use that, I mentioned that we work um, kind of with folks across the board. This is just a case study from our work with the University of Arkansas. Uh, we've got about 60 or so University of Arkansas Extension agent, agents using FarmDog today. Arkansas is the top rice producing state in the United States, about $2 billion worth of rice a year. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. And by virtue of using farm dog, <clears throat> about 100% of folks. Sorry, I think the I, I may have forgotten the um, the um, the legend on the right. But about 80% of folks have saved time using farm dog. And this this survey was actually taken about a month and a half after folks started using farm dog. So very very easy um, adoption and seeing value proposition right away. And you can see on the left hand side. <clears throat> About 80 or 90 percent of folks are using FarmDoc to share those field observations. Next slide, please. Now I've talked about adoption. I've talked about data entry. That's you know that's great, but how do we get to those actionable insights, right? And so by virtue of how we're collecting the data, first of all, a very easy way to collect it, but more as importantly, in a standardized, structured, and georeferenced way we can start to see data insights. So what you're seeing here on the left-hand side, see how pest and disease are moving in our region. We're able to create in real time, based off of user input, how things are moving across your region, across countries, across states, um, across regions, whatever it may be, without having to deal with you know, political boundaries, right? We take you know, fall army warm flies, regardless of, of where, the, where the boundary starts and stops. So we're able to do that. What you're seeing in the middle, is a visualization of the outbreak in a user's field. So you can actually see the cyclicality of the pest or disease out in the field. This is specifically a, a pest here. Um, you can see the cyclicality of the generations. Um, you can start to overlay weather on top of that. You can overlay treatments that were applied in the field. And now you can actually start to build out these real-time efficacy insights based off of user input of data. And then on the, on the, on the right-hand side, is operational best practices. What you're seeing here, this is a graph of when our users actually went out into the field and, and visited a field. So you can see a very nice bell curve. Um, our agronomists like to work in the middle of the day by 5 p.m., by 4 p.m., they're at home um, going over what they found. But you can start to look at the, at the operational aspect um, you know, to benchmark yourself. And if you're on a managerial level, really just to make sure that folks are doing what they're saying that they're doing. Next slide, please. So we get the data insights. Where it gets really interesting, in my opinion, and a few folks have touched on this, um, is getting those feedback loops in there, right? Because we all know that no matter how great our models are, they don't touch everywhere. Uh, we can't fly everywhere, but people can get to just about every spot in the field, and they're out there in their fields. And so what we can do with FarmDog, what you're seeing on the left is you know, just a screenshot of the FarmDog app. What you're seeing in the middle 
is, and Alison, can am I actually able to share my screen by any chance? Uh, yeah, you could share your screen. Perfect. Okay, so I think you have well, to maybe. stop sharing yours, and then I'll be able to share mine, and then I'll hand it back over to you. Sorry for doing this. Um, uh, yeah, but, I'm just going to see if I can do it. Actually, it might be a little bit difficult. Maybe if we can, we continue on yeah, a little okay, bit. Okay, we'll continue. Then, um, yeah. So what? So what you're seeing in the middle? This is actually a project that we're working on with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Each of the kind of red and green, green highlighted areas, as you, I'm sure you can guess, are fields. But what you're seeing in the field or in the circles around the field are what we call kind of danger radii. And so working with a model that says, um, for this is specifically for, for white flies and cucurbits, that says if you're above an economic threshold in a field um, of cucurbits, then that field is actually um, dangerous to any other fields within a certain radius. And so that's what you're seeing there. So the, the, um, the fields that are in red are up at the top. Um, they're in red, those are already above threshold. The field, the green field here in the middle that's highlighted, it's below threshold, but it's within a danger radius. So we actually need to be able to inform that grower, hey buddy, watch out, something is, something is, something is coming your way. And then the green field at the very bottom, below threshold and not in danger. Now, where does a feedback loop come in? The screenshot that you can see on the right, not sure if you can read it, but it says, have you seen armyworms in your fields? Yes or no? We're able to target our users by a, by a trigger. So, you know, pest or disease severity level, um, by geographic proximity to where that trigger was created, and then by crop type. So if you've got a field that an agronomist or researcher, somebody goes out to and says, Oh wow, you know, they're you know, fall armyworms here fifty X above threshold, right? This is this is a this is an issue for everybody in the in the area. So everybody on our platform, first of all, they can send out a warning to anybody within a certain geographic radius, so let's call it 20 kilometers, and say, Hey everybody, watch out, army worms in your area. Just as importantly though, we can build in that feedback loop and say, Hey, not watch out army worms in your area, are in your area, but hey, we think there are army worms in your area. Be vigilant, go out and scout. Did you find any? Yes or no? And then they're able to essentially enter in that information by, you know, they're, they're bypassing the whole, the, the whole, the complex observation form. They're bypassing that and sending that data back to us. Feedback loops straight into our algorithm um, and we can continue to improve that. Next slide, please. So the question for us has always been, how do we turn agricultural best practices into digital best practices? And what do I mean by that? In the US, 85% of growers, according to the US Department of Ag, scout their fields of corn, soybean growers, scout their fields. The problem is about 50% of those folks are still using paper records. And another 20% are only texting out information to somebody else. And so we're creating this treasure trove of information each and every day that can help in these early warning systems but we're just not capturing it. And so that, to me, that is probably the biggest challenge in, in what everybody's doing is how do we get folks to adopt what's going on? Next slide, please. And so here are the few things that we've learned. One is you gotta make it easy to use for all stakeholders. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into the details in a second. The second is aligning with existing operations. So in the US, as you saw, 85% of folks are scouting. So when I go out to, to my potential new users, I don't tell them, hey, you need to adopt the new process. I say, keep doing what you're doing. I'm just gonna save you time while doing it. And that's kind of the beachhead into this whole world of digital agriculture. Um, and I'll talk about some of the, some of the really cool stuff um, that have been mentioned in drones and how all this stuff fits in. Um, and then of course, the last part is actual insights. It, it doesn't help anybody if you're not giving them something to do, um, something to do with it. Next slide, please. And so what does easy to use mean from our perspective? One is multi-platform compatibility, um, iOS, Apple, and Android, low, uh, you know, low memory usage in the phone, two, offline capability. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with kind of the, the network connectivity in areas in Southeast Asia. In the US and Canada, I'd say at least half of our users are working offline um, when they're using FarmDog, another, another quarter of them are with really bad connections. So you gotta make sure it works. The third aspect is making things customizable. I'd mentioned a full, um, uh, full spectrum of types of, of severity scales. We don't force our users to use low, medium, high. 
if they were smiley faces and grumpy faces, they're able to use that. Um, you know, maybe they call it fall army worms, maybe they call it FAW, maybe they just call it army worms. We allow our users to do all that. And then the last aspect is, is shareable. And this is, I think, a very key component um, as far as what our strategy has been, and in my opinion, what is what will create a very successful initiative anywhere for any pest or disease. Next slide, please. And by shareable, I mean, first of all, you know, pub, private public partnerships. Um, I think in the United States, if I look at what happened in the US and Canada in the beginning of, of precision agriculture, digital agriculture, whatever you want to call it, too many folks tried to do their own thing and you had just parallel paths um, that there's a lot of overlap. And it's one of those situations where one plus one equals three, right? Um, and so here, for example, I, I use the extension and the USDA examples. That's where the researchers, that's where the, you know, the, the, doc, the doctors, uh, the experts sit. They're excellent at that. They tend to be less good at building out you know, mobile apps, whatever it may be. On our end, we tend to be much better at building out mobile apps, but we're not the, you know, we don't have doctorates in entomology and pathology and plant pathology, whatever it may be. And so for us, one of the key things was building out this private public partnership aspect so that we can leverage what they're credible at and what we think that we're, that we're good at. Next slide, please. Perfect. And then the last aspect of this is really, it's not just private public partnerships, it's private, private, public partnerships. Um, and this is why I enjoyed hearing about what a lot of other folks are working on is, you know, again, all this stuff has to integrate. So I talked about um, user input of data, but we've also integrated drone imagery, plane imagery, satellite imagery, um, weather information, pesticide labels. We've integrated with John Deere. Um, and really what you can see on the, on the left-hand side at the bottom of the screenshot is different data layers that our users are able to pull in um, to FarmDog. And so for me, you know, whatever region it, whatever region it is, whatever pest or disease, whatever crop type, I just think it's really key to take this sort of ecosystem approach um, and figure out how all the puzzle pieces um, fit together. So that's, that's Farm Dog. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And, and that was a great presentation. It's, um, it's, it's good to see that sort of information coming from the bottom up as well from farmers, um, current practices and, and what they're doing and, and capitalizing on that, that farmer knowledge. A um, couple of questions here. Um, how do you make sure that the data you're using for your AI engine is reliable? And how do you aggregate that from so many users into that reliable insight? Yeah, so there's a few aspects here. The first, you know, as you can imagine, if you get hundreds, thousands, whoever many users, if you get two users, <laughs> um, you're gonna have somebody writing out fall army worm in five, you know, five different ways, right? And so one of the main challenges really is um, to standardize that sort of information. And so we utilize a few things on our AI engine to just clean out, clean out the noise. Um, so just to give you an example, the first input that somebody puts in we don't utilize that in our alert system. We don't use that in our algorithms because we're just going to assume that's, that's a, a trash test um, input. And so, there, so there's a few different things in there. There's some keywords in there that, that you folks, at least in the US, tend to use over and over again. Um, and then also, for example, if somebody enters in information in the off season, right? If we get a user in Canada that, that puts in a visit and has a bunch of observations in the middle of February, we're about 99.999% sure that's not real data um, and we don't want to be using that. So we filter out a lot of that, a lot of that information. The Excellent. second aspect, yep. the, yeah, go ahead, Allison. No, 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 go, the second aspect. Yeah, the, the second aspect is really how do you, how do you standardize information, right? The, the great thing about what we do, in my opinion, is the customiz customizability aspect of it. The challenge is if you've got folks using 10 different severity scales is how do you, you know, how do you compare a one through 10 severity scale to a low, medium, high, to a percentage, to a smiley face? And there, that's really where I hand it off to our data scientists, but you know, there, there's, a, so there's a lot of research folks on here. Um, it's really just about data standardization and trying to figure out what is a way that we can standardize everything to one, um, to one cohesive scale and then combining those. Excellent. Um, Here's, a, here's another question. How important do you think it is to use or tap into those key farmer influences as a sort of focal point or, or a farm dog user or yeah. I, digital IPM user? 
I th it's incredibly important. Um, when we start off, so we've been around a little bit more than four years now. Um, when we first started off, we would go speak with growers and they'd say, who are you, right? Who, <laughs> why, why should we use your, your digital platform? We have no idea who you are. You have not been to the farmer meetings the last 20 years. You're an outsider, right? And what we learned or kind of, I won't say we learned, what we do now is really in each area, we try to connect with that, whether it's the influencer or whether it's a, a group of folks that everybody's already familiar with. So extension, for example, extension for us has been very powerful in terms of getting into new regions. Um, by virtue of using extension, those are the, the uh, what I call the original trusted advisors um, for farmers in an area that allows us to get a foot in the door with other growers. It's working with folks such as John Deere. Um, you know, I know there, di different tractor companies have, diff have, different, uh, have different strengths, uh, brand strengths in different areas, but in the US, uh, Deere is very strong, of course. Um, so working with that local dealership, who then is the one that enters us to, to the grower or to the agronomist. So it's really, really important. Um, that's one of the reasons uh, on mine and Allison's first conversation, she'd asked, you know, why are y'all, why do you, why are you not more active in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, wherever it may be? And the answer is really, you know, I could fly out. I would love to fly out again to Southeast Asia, but I would land, show up at the airport and not really know where to start. Right. And, and so it's really about getting those partners to who have vetted your platform, who have vetted your software and can bring you to a critical use, a critical number of users. Okay, just, just quickly, one more. I've got one brief question. Um, pr uh, the prize presentation before, I think, uh, they were looking at ways do they, how do they can open up that back end information um, to potentially IPM digital providers such as yourself. Um, do you think this is something that would be valuable to platforms like yourself uh, in Asia, for example? Definitely. So, you know, I, I think what's great. Um, you know, Phil, I won't, I won't speak for you, but, but what I loved about what y'all are doing is that it's an open platform. Um, and similarly on our end, we have, we have an API that we open up to our partners. So you can pull out all that data in a standardized structure, georeferenced way. Um, you can pull that out. You can do your research, your uh, push your algorithms on top of it. Um, and so for me, I'm all about open platforms. At the end of the day, our users, whether it's a grower, the agronomist, the researcher, the data is his or hers, and we want you to be able to do what you're best at. <laughs> That's pulling that out and getting to actionable insights. We're here to serve as a platform for you to do that. We're gonna provide you insights that, that we hope are helpful, but at the end of the day, you're the one that's on the ground and, and, and really knows where to push this towards. Great. Well, thank you, Leron. And, and I'd just like to say thank you to all the speakers. Um, great presentations. Very interesting. We've got a really spread um, of different views from drones uh, to pesticide pallets to, to surveillance uh, right through to prize and the UK Space Agency's ability to um, share some of its uh, data and, and Carby's plant-wise um, resources. And finally, to this uh, digital um, farming IPM tool that, that Leron has developed in the US to give us some ideas what could be capable in Southeast Asia. So thank you to all of you. I'm just going to invite now quickly um, Paul Boutier, uh, the Director of Knowledge and Innovation at Grow Asia. He's just going to provide a few thoughts and um, direct you to some, um, uh, some further information information on, on what Grow Asia is working on. Paul, are you there? Hopefully he is. Maybe not, Paul. Pranav, can you see Paul online? Uh, no, I cannot. Oh, that's okay. We're almost, um, actually, we actually have only got one minute and, and I can summarize just quickly. Um, Paul just did want to just say that there is a huge amount of information and resources that has been running through the digital program at Grow Asia. Uh, and um, what we will do is when we share the uh, presentations from this session, we will include a link to that. And that will also um, show the huge amount of, of other uh, exciting companies uh, and and entrepreneurs and, and, and development that's happening in this digital IPM space. So um, we'll definitely be sharing that with you. So, so thank you um, today for, for joining us. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. It's been a very full session with a lot of information. I saw lots of um, 
lots and lots of questions coming through uh, and many of them have been answered as well and we will provide a report of the session. We've still got 206 people who have stayed right through to the final end. Uh, it's 11.30, we've finished dead on time. I'd also like to thank Pranav, our technical support person that you just heard then and who's probably been helping people behind the scenes and to Graham uh, at start. And last of all, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone involved uh, in the ASEAN Action Plan. And also, I just um, acknowledge the support from CropLife Asia, who um, has just uh, announced uh, lately that they uh, will be helping support the development of our knowledge and innovation hub that will soon be online for the ASEAN Action Plan. So thank you to them as well. Thank you very much, everyone, and, and have, a, have a good, uh, safe day. Bye. Bye.